The woman I would like to introduce is Ms. Suzanne McCarthy. She was appointed Immigration Services Commissioner for the United Kingdom in the year 2005. Before that, she worked in a number of departments, including HM Treasury and the Home Office, where she served as Private Secretary to the Home Secretary. Before entering the public sector, Suzanne worked as a solicitor in private practice and was a lecturer in law at the University of Manchester. She's also a member of the Executive Council of the British and Irish Ombudsman Association. Previously, she was the non-executive director of the Royal Brompton and Harefield NHS Trust. The topic that she's going to speak on this afternoon is the value of regulating immigration advisors. So if you could please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Ms. Suzanne McCarthy. Thank you. Hello, it's lovely to be here. And as you can tell from my accent, I'm also an immigrant to the United uh, Kingdom, but in the Home Secretary's wisdom has decided to make me the UK's Immigration Services Commissioner. Now you may say to yourself, I've never heard of the Office of the Immigration Services Commissioner, and I've never heard of the Immigration Services Commissioner at all, and that's probably likely. So I need to tell you what I do. Essentially, I'm a regulator. I regulate those people in the UK who give immigrants advice and services. Uh, and represent their clients at various tribunals. It's a part of the jigsaw, which is quite complicated, of the UK's immigration sector. It has a lot of dimensions, political, economic, personal. And in this presentation, I'm going to set the scene about why the UK has done this, has such an office, what I do, and the value of it, and the relationship of that to the whole issue of human rights. I'm going to focus on the three areas that my office is involved in, which is regulation, handling complaints, and prosecuting those that are acting illegally. And I shall conclude by explaining how my office makes a direct contribution to protecting human rights. So if we go on to the first slide, what's very interesting about regulation of uh, the immigration advice sector is that it's not a very worldwide issue. It's very much Anglo-Saxon. Um, the countries that have an office that's equivalent to my office are essentially those in the Commonwealth community, if I can put it like that. So you have one in Australia, you have one in Canada, you have one in New Zealand. New Zealand's very interesting because it regulates not only those working within New Zealand, but those who work outside New Zealand who want to give advice to people who want to come to New Zealand. Um, and you can't put an application in to New Zealand for immigration unless you show that the advisor that you've had, what, in wherever they may be, is actually um, regulated by the New Zealand equivalent of my office. It all started, though, with the UK. The UK is always a trailblazer in these areas. And it happened in the late 1990s. I don't know how many of you remember, probably you don't, but you may have read that in the late 1990s, at the end of the John Major period in government, this country, in one of its periodic seizures of anxiety about immigrants, got into a real tizzy about the number of asylum seekers that seemed to have been finding their ways over to the UK. And they got very anxious of the flood that were coming in. And not only were they anxious about the flood, but they were anxious about how these immigrants or these potential asylum seekers or these ones who were claiming asylum were getting assistance. That anyone was popping up and saying, hi, I can help you, let me show you what to do, and it was chaos. And people were being ripped off right, left, and center. Um, and because of that, the Blair uh, opposition, as it was at the time, put into its 1997 election manifesto a commitment that if they were elected, they would create this immigration services commissioner and the office of. And they so did it on election. And in the Immigration and Asylum Act 1999, you will find my statutory remit is set out, my creation is there, and the fact that I am independent and so forth, and answer role to parliament, et cetera. So it is a very limited area. And you could ask yourself at the end of my talk, or maybe you want to ask me, and I don't have the answer, um, why just these countries? There are other countries that have looked at it, like America, for example, uh, but haven't actually done it. So 
So why do governments regulate? Have we got that right? Um, no, so we'll go back. Essentially, governments regulate because it's in their interest. Um, they're not particularly interested in being in the interest of the migrant, I would say. It's about uh, securing your borders. It's about ensuring that uh, there isn't abuse of the immigration rules and procedures. And I would expect governments to be self-interested, because why shouldn't they be? Having said that, there is a, a, a feeling also, and I don't want to make politicians sound that mercenary and difficult uh, and self-obsessed, and they could probably do that for themselves, um, but there is also a sense that consumers should be protected. And immigrants and those needing advice and services from immigration advisors um, are consumers. So consumer protection, which is a theme which runs through the U UK very strongly um, in terms of better regulation, in terms of human rights and so forth, uh, is part of the makeup of why the government is supportive of this office and the office continuing. Now, I haven't found, and maybe you'll correct me, because you're probably all specialists in this and I'm not, that there is any specific connection between human rights and economic integration that is absolutely direct. It can be argued that many human rights have an economic basis, uh, such as the right from freedom from slavery and forced labor. Um, and further, the lack of human rights is very often a reason why people leave the country of their origin. Um, so I asked myself, where does regulation of immigration advice come in, and does it add value? And if it does add value, why don't our countries regulate this sector? And I came up with this sentence, which I suppose um, summarizes what I think, which is simply put that human rights are meaningless unless you can access them meaningfully. Um, I often remember being taught at law school that human rights aren't very good if they're basically written on toilet paper in someone's prison cell. And that's essentially the same. If you don't know how to uh, take the necessary action to obtain and retain uh, your privileges of being allowed to be in this country or to get into this country, and that you have the knowledge of what action is effective or you don't have it, then you are going to be stymied as to how you're going to access your human rights. And good regulation, hopefully the type that my office provides, gives consumers confidence that those advising them are fit and competent and that it shouldn't be an excessive financial burden to them or stop them getting the advice that they need and in a form helpful to them. I emphasize fit and competent. Um, when I first came into my office, uh, there was a feeling that those that charged were actually not as good as those that were not for profit because they were motivated for the good. I don't really look at it like that. I look at it who gives actually good service. And I have seen uh, not-for-profit organizations that are very well-meaning, um, but essentially keep their files in a trunk and don't remember to put in things by deadlines and don't understand how that they need to be there every day, 365 days a year, and the client has to have confidence that they're there, rather than, well, we'll see if we're going to be here next week because we don't know if we're going to have enough money. That, to me, is as bad a service as someone being, in fact, um, unfit uh, because they are devious and criminal and are doing all sorts of heinous things, both to their clients and others. So who uses immigration advisors? Essentially, the people I'm talking about, and it could be people claiming asylum, it could be people just wanting to come to this country or to bring others to join them, they form into these sort of groups. They're very vulnerable. Often they can't speak English very well. They are often desperate, which means that they will very often cling to the person who promises them that they're going to get what they want, um, even if it seems very far-fetched and every other advisor has told them that isn't going to happen. And they are very frightened. And that affects how they will, in, they will relate to members of authority, including my office and myself. Because they're scared that if they put their heads above the parapet, uh, they're going to be thrown out of the country. Uh, so it is a very difficult group 
often to work with or to assist because they are not themselves a group in their own right. They're very disparate. And they're used very often to be in situations where I should say the Anglo-Saxon idea of how the bureaucracy and the judiciary work isn't quite what they're used to. Um, they may be in situations where they are um, the usual for them to expect a bribe to be paid. So when a bad immigration advisor or a person who isn't even regulated says, I can do it for you, but I've got to pay off the home office, they'll believe them because that's what they're used to. That's how they do it where they come from. And it's very difficult to actually um, help groups like this who are frightened and don't know who to turn to and work very much on word of mouth of who to go to. So I have three basic functions. And those functions, as I've said, is to restrict and control illegal activity, which I'll give you some examples of later, to deliver good regulation, and to help support the immigration advice community uh, by talking to them about what is good practice. You have to remember that before the OIC came into existence, um, immigration advice was the Wild West of professionalism. Um, there was no term called immigration advisor. Um, that has sort of come out of the fact that these people are now regulated. Uh, it was a real wide boy place, um, and anyone could really just wake up one morning and decide to be an immigration advisor. And so it was very unclear who was giving advice, how they were giving advice. And it was only with the creation of the office and it starting in 2001, so only really 10 years ago, um, that we were able to bring some sort of realistic component of how people should act if they're going to do this area of law. So let me look at what we actually do and what I am. Um, basically, I'm independent and I run an executive non-departmental public body. This used to be called a quengo, for those who have heard that term. It's now back to being called a quengo after being called NDPBs. Um, but essentially I am, and this is important, I am independent of government. Um, I am a separate office. I am accountable and appointed by the Home Secretary directly. I am accountable to Parliament and periodically appear before various select committees and other MPs and ministers. I have a UK-wide jurisdiction. Uh, this is because immigration in this country is not devolved. Uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales may be devolved administrations, but as far as immigration is concerned, that is a UK-wide issue, and so my jurisdiction extends throughout the UK. It does stop at the territorial waters. Um, and which is interesting, because if you really wanted to get away from me, uh, you could go to Dublin, and I couldn't do anything about you. You could go to Jersey, and I couldn't do anything about you. In fact, it was interesting, one of my um, really bad advisors who I hounded until I finally got enough evidence to get that person out of my scheme, took her um, business and went to Jersey. Um, and she then found that she couldn't work effectively. So she would periodically get on a plane and come over here and run her business from a hotel suite. But the hotel gave us evidence of her faxes. So we were able to prove that she was actually operating in this country. And we prosecuted her. And then the Essex police prosecuted her. And then the Guernsey police prosecuted her. Um, and she's no longer practicing anymore. So um, it is, however, a very jurisdictional um, situation. The number of advisors, we have at the moment around 4,000 directly regulated advisors across the UK. They operate in around some 2,000 organizations. Um, if you consider that my office only has 40 <coughs> something like 70 staff and a budget of just under 4 million, that's a lot of people to regulate with very few resources. So we have to do it intelligently. We do it a lot with joint operations with the police, the uh, trading standards board, uh, soccer, Interpol, and so forth. Because often if I find someone is doing something bad in my area, like all of a sudden handing out um, 
University of Islamabad certificates created in Croydon uh, that I normally find they're doing other things like facilitation, trafficking, money laundering, and all the other heinous things that people do when they think they can make a lot of money really easily uh, by hoodworking individuals. Um, I should say that these bodies range from one-man bands, big firms like Deloitte and Touche, law centers, um, community centers, um, big for-profit organizations. It's a whole spectrum of different types of organizations. And it increases. We have different levels depending on what you want to do. If you simply want to signpost someone, go over there and they'll give you advice. I don't regulate you. If you're doing the standard stuff, you get a level one and it goes all the way up to a level three where you can stand up and advocate um, in front of tribunals. There are things we don't do. We don't give advice. Um, my office doesn't give advice. We don't act as a membership association, though many of my regulated think I am their membership association. And I don't importantly ensure that there are enough advisors to go around in this country. There, in fact, aren't. I don't know how many of you are aware of the legal aid situation here, which is pretty desperate. Um, legal aid is still available for asylum, but it's not available really for anything else to do with immigration. A lot of the for-profit organizations have stopped because they couldn't afford to keep going. Um, a number of very large law firms who used to do immigration work have stopped because there is no money in it anymore or not enough. And therefore, you have quite a number of individuals who are rushing around trying to find legal advice, often in a very timely manner, um, because they've got, they're going to be overstayers if they don't, and they can't find anyone because there's no one out there. It's not all to do with legal aid, but a lot of it is. And there were two big not-for-profit organizations that have closed down recently, gone into administration, simply because they couldn't afford to pay the bills anymore. So it is a desperate time for people searching for immigration advice in this country. And in fact, uh, the British Red Cross are regulated by me. And the reason they decided to regulate is they couldn't find anybody to send people to. So they decided to start giving advice themselves because there was no other way they were going to help people who came to them. Going on, oh, it's a fun one here. Um, as I've said before, and this is the thing that's sort of on my chest, is that regulated advisors have to be fit and competent to give in advice and services and to encourage good practice. Uh, if they aren't fit and competent, then I tend to get rid of them or restrain them. And I've mentioned that I have a three-pronged job of regulator and complaint handler and law enforcer. Um, I regulate, first of all, by codes of standards, guidance on competence, all the things you would expect um, a, a regulator to have. I don't know how many of you have ever actually um, met a regulator before or been involved with regulation. Um, possibly very few of you, but essentially people have to confirm to me and show me through audits, uh, case file reviews, um, information that I receive by way of intelligence that they are complying with what I need and that their standards are okay and that the guidance of competence is what they're actually working to. Um, too many go on? Okay. I also operate complaints, um, and I should talk about this because this is quite useful, for particularly if you know people who may be getting immigration advice and services. I can take complaints from anyone about anyone. That includes people that are not in my scheme, either because they're regulated by some other body, like the Law Society of England and Wales, or they're not regulated by anyone and they're acting illegally, and there's a criminal offense of actually um, giving advice um, and not being regulated by somebody or advertising that. This is really important to regulation. Um, I'm not an ombudsman in the sense that I put someone back in the position they should have been in if they hadn't had the injury done to them, standard legal um, mediation or ombudsman-like response. Uh, it goes to regulation, that if I find that people are giving complaints that are substantiated, uh, then I can take regulatory action against the person involved. 
This could be by putting conditions on their license, it could be by throwing them out, it could be actually going and getting an order saying that they cannot give immigration advice for a period of time or forever. Um, so it's quite important, and we get about five to 600 complaints a year that we deal with, um, and basically I've had about six, 7,000 complaints since we've started. One thing that I ask complainants, we do a survey of them, and I say, why do you want to complain to me? Because it takes a lot of courage very often to complain to me, because they don't know if I will run off to UKBA and tell them they exist. And they all say unanimously, among other things, but what they all say is I don't want another person to have advice from this person in the way I received it because he's ruined my life or he's ruined my family's life because he, he <coughs> did things wrong and that means that my position in this country or their ability to come to this country is actually so undermined or destroyed by that person. Now let's just see. I'm missing some slides, but not to worry. Let's see if we can go back and find them. No, we can't, so I'll just talk about them. Um, talked about that. I was going to give you some examples of complaints, which I'll do now. Um, advisors failing to undertake work, resulting them in becoming an overstayer. Advisors failing to keep clients informed, so they became an overstayer. Overcharging clients, or charging for work not done. It's very interesting because the social media is making this more and more possible. Um, you may find there are a lot of immigration advisors now who never actually see the people they're advising. They do it all by internet or social media. It's very difficult to regulate that, particularly if the website is not in this country and it's not provided in this country and so forth. Um, and basically, they may say, well, you give us the information and then we'll do what you want and you pay up front. This is very dangerous because often they will pay quite a lot of money and then they can't use the advice that they're given. So overcharging clients or taking money and not doing the work is quite common. Poor advice is obviously there. Um, advisors working in an unethical manner, uh, deceiving the authorities by fabricating information or entering into um, uh, helping to enter into bogus marriages. We've had quite a lot of that at the moment, where advisors or people I don't regulate but give advice seem to be helping people go into scam marriages, uh, which doesn't help anybody. And uh, that's been something that I've been working with various newspapers who have been giving me exposés about. Um, advisors refusing to return documents to clients is a big issue as well. They'll hold on to their passport. Uh, they'll hold on to their birth certificates or their documents proving their education. And they'll say, we won't give it up unless you give me the money. So we have these sort of leverages on very vulnerable people, which are quite frightening. And as I've said, I also do um, prosecutions. Um, I'm the Helen Mirren, I think, of the uh, immigration sector. I have about 10 ex-police officers who work for me. They stand up and call me ma'am and commission, whatever. I rather enjoy that. Um, but essentially, these guys are out there pounding the beat, looking for people who are acting illegally. And they are the most frightening because they're usually the ones doing the most evil things. We've prosecuted over 150 people. Many of them have gone to prison uh, because of what they've done or have had suspended prison sentences. Um, I can give you some example. Uh, non-practicing barristers who decided that they can give immigration advice without being regulated. He got four months imprisonment. Um, people thinking that they can go to um, detention centers and assist people uh, and then doing nothing. She got imprisonment. Uh, religious leaders who say, well, I'm religious, therefore I don't need to be regulated because God regulates me. Uh, not in this country. They do need to be regulated, and they go to prison. Um, <laughs> Presumably, they pray a lot when they're there. Um, looking to the future, some of you may know that this government, when it came in, decided to do a bonfire of the non-departmental public bodies, or quangos. And there were 901 of us, uh, all in Schedule 7, which has gone out of the, docu of the bill, I should say, which is going to be an act soon. We were one of them. Um, and we had to explain 
why getting rid of us was not going to be helpful uh, to the United Kingdom. Um, and I'm pleased to say that somebody was listening somewhere, one minister at least, and we have received confirmation about two weeks ago that we will not be on the bonfire, um, that we will not be merged or eliminated, that we will continue to do our job as the regulator of immigration advice in this country. Um, that doesn't mean that things don't change. We work in a really heavy um, environment. I don't know also if you've been aware that just recently in the past two weeks, uh, the UKBA, the United Kingdom Border Agency, um, has gone through one of its periodic burnouts um, with um, the head of the border enforcement uh, being uh, first of all suspended and then resigning and then claiming constructive dismissal. God knows what's going to happen to that. Um, on the basis that he's um, exceeded the minister's um, limitations on checking at border control and acted, in her view, as a rogue civil servant and, in his view, as an upstanding civil servant. And I will let the courts and the tribunals fight that one out. Uh, but it is UKPA and working in the immigration sector is always an unusual um, and significant um, environment to work in. Um, because it's periodic rearranging itself um, and, and doing things differently. We also have the usual problem of money, because it's a tight public sector finance. I do collect money, but all the money I collect goes to the Treasury. It doesn't stay with me, though I would love it to. Um, and as I've said, there are different ways that advisors are working, and there's constant changes in government's immigration policies. So what we're going to do for the next three years in our business plan is regulate differently. Um, we believe that after a decade of regulation, those in our scheme should be mature, and therefore we're going to expect them to be more responsible uh, for themselves being fit and competent than us running around after them like children to make sure they are. And what we're going to do is take our finite resources and actually concentrate more on finding the bad guys, or the ones that are actually the greatest threat to um, people because they're doing more innovative things, uh, because they're advising more people, uh, because we've got intelligence about them which show that they are behaving in a risque possible way. So we're going to put our resources to make sure that the sector is as safe as possible for those that actually need it. Finally, I'm going to finish off by just saying what I think is my standard motto. Um, usually when I first showed this, I had a poster with it which showed a, a woman um, actually slumped against the floor looking like she'd had a bad overdose of heroin or something. Uh, and I didn't think that was quite the image to give at the end. I was also told that I couldn't end on a depressing uh -huh. note. And that's how the second line gets there. So I used to end with bad immigration advice can and does ruin lives. And it does. And I know that. I, I've heard that you're going to have a speaker from Citizens UK uh, tomorrow. In fact, we're working with Citizens UK at the moment to go out there and find advisors who consumers can trust. And I'll be speaking at their conference um, in December called the Dispora Conference um, in London on Saturday. But in addition to that, good immigration advice is in everyone's interest. It's in the interest of the UK government, and that's probably why they've kept us. It's in the interest of advisors, because it keeps the profession um, regulated, and that gives it respect, and they can have confidence that they are fit and competent to give advice. And obviously, it gives um, assistance to those who need that advice. As I explained, our regulatory jurisdiction is limited by law to the UK, but our influence could be wider. And I do know that there is concern about advice and assistance given by advisors oper operating overseas. I'm, in fact, talking to my Australian counterpart by phone in the next few days to discuss this problem specifically. And while direct regulation may not be possible, there may be other ways to tackle this potential problem, such as a more global network of regulation. So to conclude, people seeking immigration advice are easy targets for exploitation. 
And regulation, in my view, as I would say this, of immigration advice is necessary to ensure human rights for immigrants. And as I've said, bad immigration advice can and does ruin lives, but good immigration advice is in everyone's interest. Thank you very much. And I should say that if you, anybody wants to contact me, either because they're working in groups that have immigrants come in, or they are actually have a friend or themselves want to talk about any issue, regulatory, complaints, want to shop somebody who's acting illegally, uh, would you comment by contacting me at that information. I'm sure that's available if anybody wants that. Hello, ladies. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your very interesting lecture. You briefly mentioned human trafficking, and I don't know it's a problem issue, and we've unfortunately not really discussed it at all during this conference. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about some experiences or how you work with people, victims of human trafficking or traffickers in the UK. As I said, we get intelligence from lots of different sources. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen those screens where they have arrows everywhere and everyone's connected to everyone in the world through all sorts of heinous acts. Well, we do that. And we get intelligence through advisors, through public, most intelligence through the public, actually, um, through the UKBA, Interpol, Metropolitan Police, other police forces. When you get all that together, you can see patterns. And it has happened that we have seen instances, and we're the first to see it, because something in the files of the people mm -hmm. that these advisors are working for doesn't add up right. Um, people are moving in in a way that doesn't seem sensible, or the files are very repetitive in the same referee is on it, or the same bank statement with a different name. So we know that something is funny, but we're not quite sure what. And we will go then and talk to opposite numbers in the appropriate law enforcement agencies uh, or possibly the solicitor's regulation authority and say, we've got concerns. We may often find they have concerns. So you start building the picture. We've also worked with the Home Office. They have a trafficking unit, which you may not know about. Um, and we share information with them, and they share information with us. So it's a bit of antennae. We don't normally, as far as I can I mean, I, I'm not the head of the investigations intelligence team, so I can't speak if he's actually himself met a trafficked person or persons. Um, but we do get this information, and we work with these other bodies to actually form a picture. And I would expect that if we found that trafficking was there or evidence of it, that would go to those bodies who would then lead on those offenses. And very often, you will have someone taken to the criminal courts in which they will have those offenses and ours as well. So they'll be brought in a bundle. Um, but it's working with the Home Office Trafficking Unit that is our major source of, of communication on this. Now, I'll take him next. Well, and then for presenting to your office, quite, uh, quite interesting and quite important, I think. Uh, you said the last sentence, you said- I try to convince ministers how important it is all the time. It's very important. <laughs> and you said uh, good immigration advice is in everyone's best interest. Yeah. I think I couldn't agree more with this. Is your office also advising the government uh, mm. uh, in terms of what might have gone wrong so that the, the law yes. might change? Is there any? Um, we do, we, um, as I said, I'm independent of government, but obviously if there are issues, like on the points-based system, which involved immigration advisors or the regulation of that sector in some way, then I'm involved, <coughs> you know, out inside the consultation as opposed to outside, in the sense they'll work up their policies that they'll consult about having discussions with me and other government departments or bodies that are going to be affected. If I feel that they are, in fact, moving ahead in ways that I don't think are helpful to the sector, then I have the ear of the minister, but probably more importantly, I have regular meetings with very senior officials, which are the ones that really you want to talk to, to be honest. But it does all of its casework now, really, in two regions, the Northwest and Northeast. And it's a very regional organization now. And so important for me is not only to influence policies, but to influence operational decisions of how they operate with advisors. 
And it's very interesting, um, and I have good relations with them. I mean, they are working with me, and particularly on sharing intelligence. Because if I'm going off getting one of my advisors, caseworkers, to go off to audit, which is one of our principal ways, we will go to UKBA and say, we'd like a list of the cases that this advisor has put in to UKBA recently. We then check that list against the files we find. And if there are discrepancies, then we've got a smoking gun uh, because we found things that they're doing wrong. And that's really, really powerful. But really, UKBA is now very much a regional environment. The policy is still done in the center, but the operations and particularly the intelligence are done in the Northwest and Northeast. And it's a matter of influencing the whole of that plus influencing other government departments that may have an interest, like the Ministry of Justice, which of course has the tribunal service. And I need to have a good input to the tribunal service, not only because I have my own tribunal, which I don't sit on, but who hears appeals against my decision, but also the people I regulate appear in the courts and tribunals as well. So I have to make sure that they are working with my advisors in a way that I feel is satisfactory. So it's quite a complex, actually, involvement in government widely. <laughs> now, there was another person. Yes, please. Thank you. Hi, um, I would like to know which criteria might, might Sorry, I couldn't hear that beginning. I would like to know uh, which criteria must be fulfilled for you to give the OK to other advisors to operate. OK, so what do we, we look for a number of things. Um, if you were applying to come into the scheme, you have to take some tests for a start. Uh, you have to fill out quite a long <coughs> form which tells me about your organization, uh, what background you've had in terms of experience or supervision in doing this area, um, what you, whether you've had any other regulatory experience, criminal convictions. Um, we will then do an intelligence check. Uh, we will also have you go off and do a criminal records bureau check which we will have to see. Um, and then we will probably do a pre-registration audit where we get to meet you and talk through your background and give you possibly an oral test at that time to see if you understand not only immigration, but what it means to run a business. A lot of people think, you know, I'll put my sign up and people will come in and I will make money. Because I have to say about 80% now of my new applications, and I get about 20 to 30 a month, so it's not you know, one or two a year, they're, they're still coming at me, um, and, and that's the average, that they don't think through that there's only a finite amount of money out there for them to have. And we have to make sure that when they do open up, they've got a reasonable chance of still being there the next week. So it's a matter of checking their business plan, checking their financial, checking their immigration knowledge and experience, <laughs> understanding whether there's anything untoward about their background. But like anything in regulation, you know, people come in and then you find things out or they, you know, pull the wool over your eyes or whatever. And, and that's why sometimes we have to get them out as well. Or they go bad for some reason. Um, and we've had experience with that. And the point is, it's harder to get someone out of a scheme than it is to let them in. Because once they're in, then you've got to get the evidence sufficient to convince the tribunal, if necessary, that your decision is proportionate and fair and just. It isn't that difficult if once they're in, and once they're, you know, if they're still out, it's, it's much easier to keep them out. And there have been plenty of times where, um, thank God, uh, we didn't let someone in, and then they've been found to be acting badly, and we've, we've handled that. Doesn't mean someone who's never had a criminal conviction can never be a regulated advisor. It depends on how long ago it was, what it was, um, you know, the history is gone, maybe the conviction is spent. Uh, but any sort of conviction for fraud, theft, anything like that would get me a little bit nervous. So I hope that answers your question. I should say once they're in, if they want to move up levels, they've got to take tests again. And everyone has to do um, CPD, Continual Professional Development, and that's mandatory. And in fact, I'm throwing a few people out of the scheme uh, because they don't realize that continual professional development is mandatory, even though we've been telling them that for three years. So um, it's a matter of keeping people up to the mark. 
And sometimes I think, well, I'm doing, I'm doing a community service, so why don't they just let me stay there? They don't realize that actually they could be doing someone a great deal of harm if they don't know what they're doing. And that's my worry as well. Yes, please. I'll get you in there. What's my opinion of the color of the quangos? Well, we're moving far away from my remit because he gave you a list, but I'm also, I know some of you are from the University of London here, and I'm on the board of the University of London. So, I mean, I have a feeling for Goldsmith people and Brookback people and whatever. Um, and I'm also on the Public Guardian board. Uh, the University of London board, by the way, is not an NDPB. Um, the Public Guardian Board is, that's the board which regulates those who are incapable of handling their own affairs and therefore a deputy is appointed for them. That's an advisory board and I think it's right that it should be abolished because I think we did what we need to do and a new governance arrangement should be given. There are other boards, I'm also on the Human Tissue Authority. I should explain I'm on all these health authorities because I used to be Chief Executive of the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority. Uh, which handles embryos and things like that. And, and he mentioned the Royal Brompton, and I'm on the General Medical Council as well. Um, I have a strong theme of medical and medical ethics and regulation, and that's why I'm on these. Um, and the, it's interesting because people say, how do you fit in, you know, HFEA? I set up the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, and I'm the Immigration Service Commissioner. They're all about protecting consumers in relation to professionals and making sure the balance is right. But to answer your question, the H, the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority and the Human Tissue Authority are being merged into the Care Quality Commission, which, if some of you know, has had some bad publicity lately because they don't seem to be able to do all their jobs right, and now they're going to have these people as well. Um, and that we are very nervous about because they're taking the research function and putting it somewhere else and separating it off from the operational functions, which doesn't make much sense. Having said that, as a board, and I should give the public announcement, we have said we will work with government to make this happen. Now, they, we will not have that happen until 2015, and a lot can happen until 2015. You might lose government for a start. Um, who knows? But So there are different places where um, NDPBs or Quangos are right to be abolished and others not. I have to say that if we hadn't had a UK-wide jurisdiction, I think we would have been merged, but it was very difficult. And it's much easier for them to keep us going. Um, it's much simpler, and there's no great advantage for them, and they wouldn't want to lose us because they do want this regulation. So there were arguments that we could play to make it um, happen, but it's about the fifth time, I probably, in my experience, that they have thought about abolishing because they're always looking to save money and governments have to be doing something, don't they? So this is something to do. And it always looks to the public as though <coughs> bureaucracy, who are all these fat cats who you know, sit there and aren't elected and running things and making things difficult. Um, so I don't think it's all wrong. But I, and I have to say, it's always been the case that NDPBs have been periodically reviewed either quinquennially every five years or every three years. That's quite usual. But they'll need legislation to get rid of me. <laughs> they don't have time, they don't have time. Legislative timetable is very full. Uh, that's also a problem for me because I want some more powers. Because like all legislation, I don't know how many of you dealt with legislation. Legislation is only as good as when you stop operating it. And then you find all the holes, and God are there holes. I think the parliamentary draftsman had a Friday Ford operation for me. I don't know if you know about Ford motor cars. You don't want to buy one made on a Friday afternoon because the people there are thinking about Saturday morning. Um, I think my parliamentary draftsman may have had some Friday afternoon experiences. Um, and we want some powers. But I've been waiting for this bus to come along for five years. We are hopeful that maybe in 2013 there might be some legislation, but there certainly isn't going to be any legislation until then. So that's my problem. I need more powers. Give me the power. <laughs> I want to be corrupted completely. <laughs> Who else is one? Yes, please. Uh, we had talk the other day, Jason, I mentioned yesterday, um, that immigration might be orphaned off. That's I don't know what that Immigration rights should be auctioned off. What yeah, does this I mean? mean? An immigration visa, um, I think I'm translating what you're saying now. I think the highest bidder is sounding a little out like an auction. But I think this goes back to, the, to in fact, the recent <laughs> news reports that have come out. You know that there's a body that gives government advice regarding how the points-based system should work. You've all heard of the points-based system, yeah? Maybe some of you are even subject to it. 
Um, and they're tightening that up, and they want the latest have been that you should be on a salary, if you're a tier two person coming in, you should be on a salary that will ensure that neither your nor your dependents would apply for benefits. Now, of course, it's a bit strange because it's like the horse is bolted because anyone from the EU can come in and work and claim benefits. So these are discriminatory in some way because it's only affecting people outside the EU, and that's Africa, Asia. Americans don't seem to be so affected. Um, South Americans are not so affected. So people have said it's discriminatory as well, the way it works. But that is, I think, what we're talking about. <laughs> Sorry, privatized. <coughs> I'm sure that if the government could make a profit out of immigration, it would, and it does, because it charges for everything. You know, they say it's a cost-neutral system. You've probably heard that term, that we're not making, that's how I'm supposed to regulate, cost-neutral, which means that everything I do, I can charge for, but I can't make a profit. So it equates, if I have 20% of my, one of my caseworkers, then I can charge 20% of their hours to that. So it should be cost neutral. I would imagine that, that <coughs> the government has always said that its services should be cost neutral um, and that there shouldn't be a profit made. And that's supposed to be good regulation. I've never heard of the, of the UKBA or the government saying, we're not only going to be cost neutral, but we're going to help us by clawing a lot of the money. But I wouldn't put it past them. So I mean, we're in such deficit. Anything helps. If you'd like to pass the hat around for the government right at the moment, I'm sure they'll take your money. Um, so I can't comment on that, because it's the first time I've heard that particular statement. Yeah, as a gentleman from that kind of think tank. Well, right. conservative or Labour? I think it must be conservative. Have you, ha you haven't had a speaker f um, from Migration Watch, have you? All oh, right. Well, if you haven't heard of Migration Watch, this is not a publicity announcement for them, um, because I'm not a supporter of uh, Migration Watch in my personal capacity. As a professional, I have no view on them at all. Um, they take a very white ring view of, of immigration to this country. And I've met the person who runs it, um, who was a former ambassador, and perfectly, and I think his name is Andrew Green, but I may be wrong. Um, and his statement is, countries only, people only leave countries where, in fact, it is difficult for them. So if the UK concentrated on the, making those countries better economically, politically, for those people, you would not give migration to this country because there would be no reason for them to leave. And it's not, you know, it's an arguable point. Um, and he is very against, the Migration Watch is very against um, immigration in mass in this country. And you all know that this particular coalition government it's a bit uneasy with Lib Dems, but there is a view that migration is too high. And I, I remember when I was interviewed for this job in 2005, and I was asked the question, can you, it was just before an election. Um, I think I got in just before Perda when they couldn't have appointed me. And uh, they asked me, did I see any difference between the political parties in terms of their migration stance or their stance on immigration? And I said, the rhetoric is different, but I don't think the underlying themes are. I think this country has a, an island mentality still. And, and if you look at UKBA, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the logo on UKBA. Oh, it's fascinating. It's called Securing the Borders, Protecting the UK, or something like that. It's all defensive. <laughs> you know, you don't want to come in. And I remember about two years ago, I did an MA in, um, sorry, an MSc at the University of East London in international developments, and I took part of my module in human rights uh, and immigration. And uh, just that year, the UKBA sent out a Christmas card. Now, a Christmas card, it's all about an immigrant, you know. Mary and Joseph are fleeing to Egypt, you know. They didn't get there and say, well, can you have me your passport? And I'd like to make sure you've got your points based, thanks, and so forth. Um, and, you know, they've got a baby with them, no less. I mean, gosh, you know, the terrorist threat must have been really high. Um, and um, they sent out this Christmas card, which I could, it was electronic, and it built, you know, up to the point. And it was all things like, we protect the borders, we don't let people in, we keep people out, you know, it was something like that, it wasn't quite those words. 
Um, and I sent it to my lecturer, who said, I'm going to use it every year, because this is just so extraordinary. And in fact, members of the church, um, a number of bishops, um, did complain of the Church of England that this was not appropriate. And Lynn Homer, who was then the chief executive of UKBA, did, um, did admit maybe it was a bad judgment uh, to have that particular Christmas card, because it did express a view which wasn't very welcoming. And, um, you know, you could say that there is a fortress UK mentality. I'm speaking privately in saying that. Obviously, as Immigration Services Commissioner, I have a different role. I'm not in charge of policy. Um, but you can see it from the fact that things have tightened up, points-based system has come in, people are concerned about borders, they're concerned about terrorism, the Olympics is making everything very, very tense. Um, and right, and, you know, and there is some rationale for it. I wouldn't blame the government for it, but most, I think, politicians do have a sensitivity about this. And I know you've had some politicians come and talk to you uh, from the Labour. I don't know if there's been any Conservative or Lib Dem. Have there been any? <coughs> That's interesting. Um, you haven't had Damien Green, the minister, and I know you haven't had the Home Secretary. He's probably very busy at the moment figuring out how we're going to do the borders when myself and my colleagues go on strike next week. Um, the first time I've ever struck. I've got this very strange email from my union telling me how to do it. <laughs> first division civil servants don't go on strike. <laughs> you know, gosh. So I've, I've been told where to go and protest and where to wave a flag. Um, but anyway, I'm, I hope that gives you some background. I'm rambling, but that's me. So my staff are used to that. Other questions? Yes, please. It's more of a comment than a question. I don't know how many of you read or even look at something called the Daily Mail. <laughs> do well, If you're not used to this kind of thing, do go out and get a copy of the Daily Mail. It is a, a newspaper written by men for women, basically. Um, and the Daily Mail is very interesting because the Daily Mail does not like immigration as a concept, but it does like an immigrant. So you'll get the paper on the same day, we'll have an article saying, this poor girl from Nigeria is an A-level student. She's predicted to get five A's at A-level. She's got a place at Oxford, and they're throwing her out. Isn't that terrible? And then the same day, you'll have a front page saying, look at all these immigrant scroungers coming in to get our benefits. Um, you know, it's, it's schizophrenic. And in some ways, I think the Daily Mail, which is a very popular newspaper, maybe not as popular as the News of the World before it went hacking, but it, was, it, was, it is popular. And I always look into it because it tells you about the average person's views of the world. So it's an interesting paper to read. Um, that it represents this sort of difference between I know him, he's OK, and those people over there are stealing my jobs, and you get that, or my houses, because we have new, new houses being built, or they're taking the benefits, and I need those benefits. Or if you look at the Evening Standard, immigrant family of 12 living in mansion in Kensington with 1.8 million pound house value and getting 15,000 a week, um, you'll get those stories. So they prey on the mind, and you get this sort of schizophrenic. I have to, I'll finish with this, because I no doubt you want me to finish at 2.30. Um, I'm, I'm an American, you can hear that in my voice. I've never actually lost it. But I am a British subject. Uh, but I think I am the only American-born British civil servant. Um, certainly the only American-born British civil servant who's worked for two home secretaries. Um, and therefore I have a very strange perception of, of the British bureaucracy. And I do remember my first year at the Home Office and um, someone was explaining to someone about the fact that I would grow up and say, hello, my name is so-and-so. You didn't do that on the left. These are Brits. You know. Nobody stands there like that. Um, and I would constantly grow up and say, you look great today, and so on. You're very American. Um, and um, finally, I heard someone tell someone, don't worry, she's American. They're different, you know. <laughs> so, and I've always used that, because I think being different lets me do all sorts of really outrageous things in this society. So on that happy note of my difference, and viva la difference, um, I think it's time probably for the panel session, is it not? Did I miss any important questions, just in case I've cut anyone off in their prime, or even before death? OK, fair enough. Thank you.
So thank you very, very much, uh, Ms. McCarthy.